had two men on different sides of the world, but in their area, they made a great difference. Paul Crouch in the religious world, before there were a Trinity broadcast, every time a religion program was aired, at the close of that program, the station would say, the views that was expressed by these people, the preceding people, does not reflect the views of the station. They had to give a disclaimer. But when Paul uh, brought in Trinity Broadcasts, he did no longer have to say that. What he said was that this is the truth, and this is God's word, and we are not apologizing for what we said. On the other spectrum of the world, man spent 27 years in prison for what he believed. 27 years. And when they did let him out at 72 years old, they thought that maybe, you know, he would be too old to do anything. But look what God did. A whole country, whole country was changed. Apartheid was changed because of Mandela. Never give up on your dreams. Never give up on your dream. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. When you get it, say amen. amen. All right, so I'm still looking. 24 through 29. I'm sorry, 27. All right, are you ready? Amen. Let's read together. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receive the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that strives for the masteries is temperance in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertain, so fight I, not as one that is beat in the air. For I keep under my body and bring it into subjections that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself be not a castaway. Bow your head with me for a word of prayer. Dear God, I thank you for these that are here tonight. Thank you, God, for everything that you have done and everything, God, that you are continuing to do. God, just for a few minutes, we asked in God one more time that you would let down, God, your anointing. God, that stronghold will be broken that your word will have a free course, that men, women, boys and girls, God will be able to receive your ungraft word, that it will, God predict them, it will God predict their hearts, it will dwell in their minds and their spirits, that they may be able, God, to follow you. And I give you the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I give honor to Ella William, to our first lady and co-pastor, Dr. Betty Jean Harden, our elders, our ministers, our mothers on tonight, and all of you that are here, God bless you, and thank you for being here. On tonight, we're going to talk about self-control. Help me say self-control. Now, the word for self-control is the word temperance, and the Bible said that we should be temperate in all things. I mean that we should have self-control in everything that we do. And many people that could have been successful, but they did not have self-control. What if Mandela had played into their hands? This never would have took place. But he had self-control. And even after 27 years in prison, he forgave them. There was no bitterness in his heart. So we have to understand that when we uh, depend, uh, we are involved. And we got to remember that uh, when we are talking about self-control, it involves how much time and effort that we are willing to sacrifice 
to be received or to receive what God has for us. And sometime without temperance, we won't get what God has for us. Just one outburst, just one wrong thing can cause you to lose what God had for you. Moses did that. Just one self on self-control. God told him to speak to the rock. He hit the rock, and he called the people rebels. And that, that, that moment of temperance, losing control of his temperance, he couldn't see the promised land. Now, the same verse here, the life application, chapter uh, 9, verse 24 through 27, it reads this way. It said, in a race, everyone runs, but only one person get first prize. So run your race to win. To win the contest, you must deny yourself many things that would keep you from doing your best. An athlete goes through all this trouble just to win a blue ribbon. So I'm running straight to the goal with purpose in every step. I fight to win. I'm not just shadow boxing or playing around. Like an athlete, I punish my body, treating it roughly, training it to do what it should, not what it wants, not what it wants to do. Otherwise, I fear after enlisting others for the race, I myself might declare, be declared unfit in order to stand aside. That's how the life application translate this for these those verses now to complete a given task requires purpose and this discipline we there's something that we can never finish if we do not have a purpose for it or disciplined now Paul used this illustration to teach that Christian life take hard work it takes self-denial and it takes some grueling preparation a lot of things that God tells us to do, we have to prepare to do it. And everything that we prepare to do is not easy. Something we don't really want to do. As Christians, we are running towards our heavenly reward. And they, these are the essential things we need to prepare for in Christian race. Now here's what we need to prepare for that is grueling. We need to prepare for praying. We need to know how to pray the right prayers. And prayer, you know, if you pray the wrong prayer, it's not going to be answered. If you pray the problem, that's what it is, the problem. And you pray the problem, God, you know that they're doing this, that's the problem. He already know it, you know it. Yes. So you need to pray the answer and not the problem. The other thing that, is, uh, is that we are essential in fighting and being, uh, having tempers in is Bible study. Bible study is more important than preaching. Because when you preach, you're heralding. You're telling the people something. But when a teacher, a, when you're teaching, a teacher teaches from observation. A good teacher has to observe and note, write down, declare, make notes, do a whole lot of things uh, for, to teach. So uh, one of the most vital things is to come to Bible study. And then we should have peer worship. That's one of the things that prepares us for the race, peer worship. Not just worship, you know, just for a certain time. But worship should go on in our hearts at all times. We should have worship that will help us to run with, with strength and not just observe from the side, side line. But we also need to stay in the race. Look at somebody and say, we need to stay in the race. Now, at times, this means we must give up doing something we want in order to do what God wants. So in this Christian race with self-control, we will not be able to do everything we want to do. Every time you want to do something, everything that you want to see, a place you want to go, uh, you won't be able to do that because that's part of discipline. That's part of self-control. Now, each of our individual goal determine a discipline and a denial, and we must accept. Without a goal, discipline is nothing but self-punishment. So here's the thing, what I'm saying, is that for a certain goal, there's a different dif discipline. If you ask God for something today and you want it, 
and then you got to prepare yourself to get receive that. But now, when you ask God for something else, there's another different, different discipline. The same discipline that you use to get this one thing is not going to get you everything. All right. Everybody understand that? So it's, it's different discipline for a different goal. And so you, when, you, when you understand that there's some time I got to control myself in each area that I'm asking God to help me in. Because I just can't ask him to con control me in one area and then be out of control in another area. If I'm out of control in one area, read my lips. If I'm out of control in one area, I'm probably out of control in every area. Why would you say that, Pastor? Because the Bible says that if you fail in one thing, then you're guilty. Y'all you scared to say it? Yes, you're guilty of them all. Is that what it says? Yes, so then if I'm failing in one area of my life, that means that I'm going to fail in some other areas. Yes, so when I go please God, our denial seemed like nothing compared to the eternal reward that is ours. There's a lot of things we don't want to go through. And we don't want to deny ourselves. And we don't want to use self-control. But when we do it for God, and when we find out what the reward is, for discipline ourselves, it will seem like it is nothing. Yes, or it was nothing. Now, when Paul said in verse 27, he might be declared unfit in order to stand aside, he was not talking about losing his salvation. No, he was talking about losing his privilege to tell others about Christ. Now, how can you lose your privilege to tell others about Christ? Here it is. His heart, when we give others advice, we don't abide by ourselves. What did I say? It's hard to give others advice that we do not abide by ourselves. That's the danger in being a preacher, a missionary, a teacher, when you're teaching other folks what to do and you don't do it yourself. And people are looking at you and you think they don't notice you. If we are going to win the prize, we must stay in the race. Paul said those who that complete must be temperance, which means you're going to be in strict training all the time. A person that is, a, is in a race, uh, training for a race, they have a whole lot to do. You cannot run in a marathon 26 miles and you haven't ran one mile. Because your body, your system in your body, you can't eat enough food to sustain you for 26 miles. You can't drink enough water. You got to have somebody on the way to toss you some water. Somebody throw some water on you. Somebody throw you a handful of pasta. Most of the people that run in that marathon, they eat pasta that night. You don't eat no ice cream and sugar and stuff. They eat pasta. You eat some ice cream, you're going to fall out probably the next four or five miles. You, got, you out of it. No, the sweets weaken you. But they eat pasta. They don't even eat meat. They eat pasta. Something the carbohydrates are going to hold on and keep them going. And matter of fact, the marathon that started, I can't think of this guy named Phimetus or something of that nature, but the first marathon, he was not intended to run that. But they won the battle, and he wanted to get back to the king to tell them that they had won. And he, won, he ran 24.4 miles. And when he told the king that they had won, he collapsed and died. He collapsed and died. And then when they start training for the marathon, it was only 24 miles they were running. But in order for the queen to look out the window to see the marathon at the closing of it, they stretched it 2.2 miles so the queen could see them cross the line. That's how it got to be 26 miles. That's how it got to be 26 miles, a marathon. And, and they, they train for that. And so if you're going to stay in the race, that means that you're going to do some strenuous workout. Basketball players. Football players, they have to go to camp. And they go there, the, 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 the training does two things. It eliminates the one that's not fit. And it discipline the one that wants to make it. That's the truth. In, in football, they call it hell week. Anybody, any football players here? They call it hell week. You go out there in that heat and you put on them, 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 the, the, the tarts and you work out. And you're sweating in 100 degrees. And now, if you can make it, you can take it, you're going to make it. Basketball, they have to do the same thing. 
That's why most of the professional basketball players go overseas and play all the year so they don't have to go back to just try to get in shape. Because running up and down that court, that's 26 miles in a night. <laughs> that's 26 miles a night going up and down that court. So it's, it's discipline. Now, an athlete must forego some comfort in order to train so that they can compete effectively for the prize. Now, this is no substitute for taking personal responsibility. Now, for the last few months, uh, I've been back into walking. My wife and I, I walk with her twice. She walks more than that, but I walk twice a week on Tuesday and Thursday, uh, two miles each, each day. But that's my limit, walking. I walk up here a lot, so I get up some extra exercise. Yeah, you know, I get some extra exercise. So, but you know what? When I walk the two miles, she want to, she goes a little further. I cut in and I go home. <laughs> and uh, this morning we was walking and we just had turned the curve and she it was you know it was cold this morning, 45 degrees. And she said, "You warm yet?" I said, "Honey, I haven't even started yet. It's, I wasn't warm when we got back. <laughs> yeah, it didn't get warm to me at all. Uh, so." <laughs> So, did anybody understand what I'm talking about? So, it didn't get warm to me the whole time I was walking. But that's what you do. It's discipline to stay in shape. Now, uh, there's a substitute to, uh, for taking personal responsibility. And we have to learn how to take responsibility. It is so significant that it is mentioned uh, at the end of Galatians 5 and 22 and 23. The word self-control or the word temperance is mentioned at the end. And we must understand that there is a difference between gifts and gifts of the Spirit and fruit of the Spirit. Now, remember, there's a difference between what? The gift of the Spirit and the what? Fruit of the Spirit. Because sometimes people get them mixed up. Now, let me tell you the gift. Now, the gifts are absolutely free. Help me say the gifts yes. is absolutely free. When we receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit, we obtain the fullness of all his gifts freely that God want to give to us. See, a gift is given and we receive it, but it doesn't mean that we know what to do with it. That's why a lot of folks violate their gifts. That's why the Bible said gift is, is, is gift what? Is without calling. Calling is without, all right, now, so, but what God said, if you misuse the gift, he's going to deal with you. And a lot of folks are working on their gifts. Now, God does not take the gift back, but he certainly will chast chastise you for misusing it. And then one control, here's the two people that controls your gift, you and the prophet, the preacher. The Bible says your gift is subject to the what? Prophet. So whatever gift you have, if the prophet says that's it, that's enough, if you keep going, you're out of control. You're out of control. So it's subject. Now, but, but now here's the difference in that gift and the temperance or the fruit. And temperance is a part of the fruit. Fruit have to go. It have to grow. What did I say fruit have to do? Grow. grow. You don't just, you know, your fruit start with a seed and then a vine, a stalk, and a tree. It takes time to grow. So it takes time to learn temperance. If you don't learn temperance, then temperance is going to hurt you. Now, a gift is given and we receive it, but it doesn't mean we know what to do with it. Fruit has to grow and that takes time. We have to water, we have to nurture it, and all gifts of the Spirit are subject to the control of the person who has the gift and the person that is a prophet. But when you have a gift, it has to be nurtured. Self-control is vital. As we grow into self-control, we will grow into the ability to love unconditional in all things. Now watch what self-control, what happens when you don't have self-control. Let's go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. All right, James chapter 1, if you have it, say amen. And let's look at verse 13 through 14 and 15. 
All right, are you ready? Let no man say what? What? I'm tempted of God. For what? God cannot be tempted with what? Neither what? All right, now if God don't tempt you, who is the tempter? Who's the tempter? Say that's what Jesus told us. Then Jesus said, when the tempter come, that's the devil. All right, now, but every man is what? When he is a what? And an entice. That's a bait. So then, your lack of self-control will cause you to be out of control. Okay. All right, let me say that again. Our lack of self-control will cause us to be out of control. And when we get out of control, watch what happens. Then what? When lust, desire have conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is what? What happened? Bring forth death. And verse 16 said what? Do not err, my beloved brother. So God said don't err because that brings forth sin. And there's a whole lot of folks that because of temptation and they did not have the self-control, they are now paying the price. Now, we will learn how to have patience when we have self-control. We will learn how to have joy. We will have learn how to have to be able to operate in long-suffering, persevering, kindness, gentleness, and all these fruits require self-control. If you don't have self-control, you're not going to have love. If you don't have self-control, you're not going to have joy. If you don't have self-control, you're not going to be able to have operating long suffering. You're not going to persevere. You're not going to be kind. You're not going to be gentle. All of those things require temperance. That's why it came on the end. Now, some people have tried to develop self-control by isolating themselves. You don't get self-control by isolating yourself. You learn self-control by being around folks. How you going how you going to learn self-control? And nobody never slap you. How you gonna learn self-control? Nobody never called you out your name. How you gonna learn self-control? Nobody never talked about you. You isolate yourself. Now, here's a good example of this. A monk in the desert may have the appearance of spirituality, but he will never be affected. Since he never talked to anyone, he doesn't he don't do anything that could influence anybody in the word. So he ain't doing nothing. He's dressed up like he's doing something, he's hiding. But what effect is that? What is he doing? What is he doing? And they go through a lot of rituals. And I've told a story before about a monk. Man went into the monastery and the, for 10 years and they brought him up. And they asked him, what is the problem? And he said, food bad. He had two words to say, food bad. And they sent him back for 10 more years. He came up the next 10 years and said, you got two more words to say. He said, bed hard. And they sent him back for another 10 years and brought him up at the last 10 years. He had been there 30 years, said two words. And he said, I quit. <laughs> and they said, no wonder. They said, all you did is complain for the last 30 years. So, so you're not helping anybody in isolation. <laughs> you don't help nobody in isolation. So you got to be among folk. Because Jesus told us to go what? Into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. So you can only help folks and have temperance when you learn to do what God says. And so to complete a given task requires purpose and discipline. And, and Paul used this illustration to help us, to tell us what to do and how to do it. And so we have to learn that we have to do what God tells us to do. Now, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 15, verse 19 through 20, tells us about the flesh about the lust and about what goes on in the work of the flesh. All right, you have that Galatians 5, 19, and 20. Two verses tells us about that. All right, you have it? 5 and 19 through 20. And 19, 5 and 19. You ready? Now, the works of the flesh are what? Manifest, Manifest which are these. What is it? Adultery, what else? Fornication, what else? Uncleansing, what else? Lasciviousness. Verse 20, what? Adultery, witchcraft, hatred, variance, immolation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies. Now, 21, let's go to 21. What else? 
envying, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I also told you in time past. They which do such things shall not what? Now notice what he said, and this is why you have to be careful when people tell you once in and you can do whatever you want to and you're still born again, you say. He said, whoever do these things, such thing shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not inherit it. Now the Life Application Bible translates these verses this way. He said, but when you follow your own wrong inclination, when you follow your own wrong inclination, your life will produce these evil results. Impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, spiritualism, that is encouraging the activities, encouraged by the activity of demons, haters and fighters, jealousy, anger. You will be con you will be constantly trying to get the best for yourself. Do y'all see what this is saying? Constantly trying to get the best for yourself. Complaining and criticism. You get the feeling everyone else is wrong except those in your own little group. And there will be wrong doctrines, envy, murderers, drunkenness, wild parties, all sorts of things. Let me tell you again, as I have told you before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what Paul says. Now, let's look at some of these things because sometimes we read these things and we just read them for words and we don't understand what they're saying. So I decided tonight that I would break them down to you word by word. Adultery, it involves unfaithfulness and a failure to honor commitments in the most important relationship in our life apart from God, and that is our spouse. That's what adultery does. It's, you said, for better or for worse. You are to cleave to your wife, cleave to your husband, and when you commit adultery, you have violated your commitments. That's a vow that you violated. Now, idolatry, anything that become more important than God. What did I say idolatry is? Anything that become more important than God. And I wonder how many people tonight that put something before God and they shout on Sunday. They even preach to folks on Sunday. They teach folks on Sunday. But they got other things that they put before God. And he said, put no other God before me. What about hatred? Hatred is being hostile to men. It includes contention, which involves quarreling. It involves wrath. It involves dissension, which is division. It involves disunity and lack of self-control. Now, think about that. Hatreds have a series of things. If you hate somebody, Notice what, what, what it says. If you hate somebody, you are hostile to them. You're not kind to folks you hate. So we are hostile to them. And when you're hostile to them, that means that brings on contention. Because they're going to say something to you. When they say something to you, then you're going to become quarreling. You're going to start arguing. And when you start arguing, you get angry. That's wrath. And by once you got wrath set in, God help me here, then dissension sets in, which is division. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. I don't want to be around you no more. I don't care if I ever see you again. If I don't see you again in a thousand years, it's a thousand years too soon. Then it involved disunity. You don't want to, disunity, that means that you don't want to be in nothing that they're in. We have that in the church. I don't want to work in this if so-and-so is in it. I don't want no part of what they're in. Now, y'all act like you ain't heard nobody say that. That is disunity. We are a body that should be together. And when you hear somebody say that, you ought to check them. Say, are you in the fellowship? Are you a part of the brotherhood? Are you part of the sisterhood? When you say if so-and-so is going to work in it, you don't want to work with them? And there are some folks, if they are not the boss, they don't want to work with nobody. They think they know more than anybody. 
which involves division, disunity, and lack of self-control, which also, think about this little word, hatred. Hatred can lead to murder. Yes. Most people kill folks for money, or for anger, or murder. All of that happened. Hatred. They hate what you did, or they hate what you have. Then jealousy. Jealousy and envy are twins. One is stronger than the other. Jealousies hate what a person has. Envy wants the same thing. What did I say jealousy is? You hate what your brother or sister have. Envy said you want the same thing or something better. You envy them because they have it. Jealousy said I hate they have it. They think they have something because they got this or they got that. Wrath, I told you about that, furious, uncontrolled anger. Murder, fairly self-explanatory, isn't it? Drunkenness refers to intoxicated. That means that you have taken something because intoxication says that you took something toxic that alter, <laughs> that alter your mind. Now, we say, we can say that poison is toxin, but that's a killer. But now, do liquor, cigarettes, marijuana, cocaine, heroin, harsh, all this stuff, is that killers? For some people it have. For some people it have. So being intoxicated is a killer. Reveling. That means that 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 that, that means letting loose, raising hell, or just having a wild time. Wild time. Nobody always oh, having a good time. Nobody stop you from doing that. Oh, I'm nobody stop me. I'm having a good time. You 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 don't want to have no good time. You in the church and you ain't having no good time. I'm having myself a good time. Anybody ever heard folks say that? I have. All those things are desired appetites of the flesh. Do you know how many things you go back and count those? How many things that Paul said in this one verse of 19 through 20 that the flesh and then go back and count the things that the spirit offers and there's no law. But this is over 20 things that Paul said are the appetite of the flesh. And verse, uh, verse uh, 19 and 20 through 21. 19 through 21, you got over 20 things. And, and right under there, 22 and 23 are the fruits of the Spirit. You only have nine. You got twice as many things the devil pulling on you for the flesh as the Spirit is telling you to have for, to keep yourself in control. You keep yourself in control with nine principles. And you get out of control, you got hundreds of them. <laughs> hundreds of them. Isn't that something? Now, now what God says, I want you to look at this verse, and we're going to deal with this in a while. I want you to get your Bible and go to Psalms 37 and 4. One of the mis most misunderstood scriptures in the Bible. And I've said it myself, and I've used it wrong for a long time. Until I did a word stirred on it, and then I, my eyes was open. Psalms chapter 37, verse 4. If you have it, say amen. Short little verse. What does it say? Delight yourself in the Lord, and what happened? Thy own heart. Wow. How many of you have quoted that scripture? For yourself. Come on, let's see your hand. Don't be afraid. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He in the Lord, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. I've said it. I've said it. I've said it. I've said it. But tonight, 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 we're going a little deeper. <laughs> we're going to look at this. This scripture is what is called antithetical. What did I say it's called? Antithetical and it's called parallelism. Antithetical parallelism. 
Huh, what is that? We know anti means what? Yes. All right. Anti do means against. That's a major, major thing. But it also means something else. What do it mean? Same as. So anti means against, and it means the same as. But now this is antithetical. Antithetical. Action with it. So the first word in there is what? Delight. Delight yourself what? What do the word delight mean? To, Lord, to rejoice in, be happy. When you are delighted in something, so it told you to be delighted, delight yourself in the Lord. It is overjoy. It's joy above happiness. You are delighted. You are just excruciating happy. You're delighted in God. You are above the average person because if you're delighted in something, you talk about it. You talk about it. You dream about it. How many of you remember when you were delighted in that man or that woman? You thought about him all the time. You dreamed about him. You were delighted. You lit up when they came around. Your heart papiated. Your heart was like the, like the deer at the brook. You panicked. You were breathing loud. You couldn't even say what you wanted to say because you wanted to make sure you say the right thing. See, y'all don't, 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 is I'm talking to real folks? <laughs> am, I am I talking to real folks? That you, you didn't know how to say it because you didn't want to say anything offense. Now, delighted in God is you're just delighted. You're just so happy. You just praise him all the time. And then I heard the man say something today on Trinity that he said, the Bible didn't say, but we do it. And I, we had never thought about it, but he said, we do it. He said, when we lead people to Christ, and so you all may have to check me a few times on this because what the man said was true, and I want to be biblical. He said, when we lead people to Christ, he said, we tell them to close their eyes. He said, but there ain't nowhere in the Bible that Jesus told anybody to close their eyes when he lead them to Christ. He said, you close your eyes can be a form of being ashamed. And he said, if you're ashamed to own me before men, I'm going to be ashamed to own you. And maybe that's the reason why we have so many people that's ashamed in the church, because they got saved with their eyes closed. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, I'm... I'm <laughs> but now, delight thyself in the Lord. So if you are happy and pleased with the Lord, he shall what? He will give you the desires of what? Of your heart. Now, this is what is called, I told you, an antithetical. It means exactly opposite or exactly the parallelism means close to the same. So, ladies and gentlemen, with self-control, that means that when I ask God for something, that I am just as happy about loving God as I am for what I'm going to ask him for. But because it's parallel, what I asked him for have to make him happy because I'm asking. Go to this side if you all didn't seem to get it Please over pass. here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> because it is antithetical, anti <laughs> and it is parallel. That same rejoicing that I have about God, that whatever I ask for in my heart, because I'm really happy about God, it'll make God just as happy because it's parallel with how happy I am. So if I ask God something that do not please him, that means that I miss what I was supposed to do. It's not antithetical. And it's not parallel to what God wants. It's not the same. Whew. 
is not the same. And so then we wonder why we didn't get it. Because we asked in a myth for our own selfish gain. So, parallelism is something close to resemble. It's like a synonym. It, 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 it's called uh, the word synonymous. Uh, synonym. Synonym are words that are so close to syntax, like they, we used to call them, them um, a band, what do you call them, band, band, band of stretch pants we used to get back in the 70s club. What do you call them, band? Well, they call it spandex now, but then back then it was them, them they, was, they had devil knits. Devil knits, they called them spandex pants. You know, we got them, they, was, they, they stopped making them out of cotton and started making them out of synthetic, syntax. You know what I'm talking about. Now, <laughs> and, you know, they, if, you, if the people that were smoking, if they put a cigarette on, it's melted. Polyester, that's the word, polyester. I knew I'd get some of you all that knew what that was. Polyester. <laughs> now, polyester blends, but it's not cotton. No, it's not. Polyester didn't breathe. Cotton did. Yes, sir. You put them plastic pants on. <laughs> You're going to be hot. <laughs> so, I, I, so what is happening then? We, by not using self-discipline, are having... Uh, self-control and being controlling over things, we have taken scriptures because what the scripture said that on the one side, watch what the first side is, delight thyself in the Lord, semicolons. Delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give thee the desire of, 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 of thine heart. So what's on the first side have to be applied to the, same, to the other side. So you can't delight yourself in the Lord on the first side and don't delight yourself in the Lord on the second. It's one. And so what we got to do then in having self-control, if we praise in God for something, for what he did, let's praise him for what he did not allow us to do. Do y'all understand what I just said? If I praise him for my blessing. And then he stopped me from doing something that I wanted to do. We ought to praise him for that also. Yes, Amen. And that's a lot of time we need to.